So today I'm going to try to speak a bit about the ending of um, the Omer, uh, Severe to Omer, the counting of the Omer, uh, which we're coming to, and which represented the days of preparation for uh, Shavuot, or, you know, in some translations, it's called the Feast of Weeks, um, which literally means weeks. Um, it also is called Pentecost, and the Septuagint started translating it to uh, Pentecost, Penta meaning five, or Pentecost meaning 50. Um, so it, the Omer lasted 49 days, and then on the 50th day was uh, Shavuot, or the Feast of Pentecost. Um, so I'm going to try to bring that and what it means, kind of how it was done biblically, and uh, how it's kind of done in Jewish practice, and highlight certain things as to why it happened a certain way for the early disciples and believers in Jerusalem, and why the spirit, the significance of the spirit coming on Pentecost. Um, so yeah, and we're going to try to, I'm going to try to get into it as much as I can. Um, obviously, it's a massive topic, but more than anything, this feast represents um, the giving of covenant. It represents the giving of the Torah to Israel. Um, on Shavuot, it represents the day that Israel stood at Sinai and received the covenant of God or the Torah, um, which is like a marriage contract with the nation of Israel. After they had proceeded to go through a series of or a process of purification, um, um, you know, or zehirut or, or enlightenment in their minds to become believers in God and see a supremacy over uh, the things of the world, because essentially the nation of Israel was uh, just no different than Egypt when Moses went there to deliver them, um, other than they had the merit of their ancestry through the, the patriarchs. Um, they had fallen into the world. They had become part of the world. And so God had to rip Israel literally out from, from Egypt uh, through signs and wonders. And Israel went through a process of entering into the faith of Abraham um, in a journey like or a sojourning uh, to, to Mount Horeb or, or Sinai. So I'm going to try to get to it. I'm going to actually speak and read directly from the Hebrew Torah today. Um, and I'm going to actually even expound upon some of the things the rabbis teach um, about it, um, which is to show the power of this moment. And then I'm going to apply it to the new covenant. So uh, obviously I'm going to read first out of Leviticus 23. And verse 15, it says here, Moses says, You shall count for yourself from the morrow of the rest uh, of the rest day, or the Sabbath, from the day when you bring me, bring the omer of the waving, seven weeks, and they shall be complete. Until the morrow of the seventh week, you shall count 50 days, and you shall offer a new meal offering to Hashem. Hashem is God. That's the name of God. They just don't say it in English because of, of its holiness. Um, with the bread, you shall offer seven unblemished lambs in their first year, one bull and two rams. They shall be an elevation offering to Hashem with their meal offering and their libations, a fire offering, a satisfying aroma to Hashem. You shall make, take one he goat as a sin offering and two lambs in their first year as peace offerings or shalomim. Uh, very interesting about this part is. Um, during the times of the temple, the, the Shalomim offering, everybody in the community of Israel had to give a half shekel towards its purchase, meaning everybody as a community, as a people, were responsible for bringing a peace offering to God. It's, it's very interesting that this is one of the only feasts where the implication is not atonement so much as it is a celebration. And, and coming into uh, a point of revelation of who God truly is. It was also the beginning of the time of the harvest. It's interesting. It starts at the, the beginning of the month of Shavan, uh, the second month after Passover, um, which, you know, if, if you look at the Hebrew in the sense of the months, uh, the months of Iyar, which is the month before Shavan, actually stands for God healing the land and bringing uh, the process of death 
and renewal to a completion. And it's not a coincidence that this is happening in the world right now during this time. I believe that God is saying he is bringing healing and restoration to our land, and he is going to reveal himself in this time to his people like never before. So long we've kind of placated and mixed around into a, a, a kind of the worldly system, and God is in an effort, removed all those things in order for us to really uh, uh, come to a point of, you know, the rabbis call it zehirut, or, or a self um, a self-searching of, of where we stand before God. And so he's removed all these things in order for us to enter into something new. I believe that, um, you know, God is going to move very drastically soon. Um, I believe that it's not a coincidence. I don't believe anything's a coincidence with God. Um, you know, he controls everything, so he, he's in control. Amen? So um, I'm also now going to switch to Exodus 19, where leading up to the um, revelation of Sinai, as it's called, or Mount Sinai and giving of the Torah. It's Exodus 19, 7 and 9. So we're going to look here. Sorry, I'm on the wrong page. It says, Moses came and summoned the elders of the people and put before them all the words that Hashem had commanded them, or God had commanded them. And the entire assembly responded together and said, everything that God or Hashem has spoken, we shall do. He hadn't said yet what God wanted from them. It's very interesting that the people literally at this point, it's, it's an entering into almost a marriage. They're saying, we will bind ourselves to him no matter what. So they don't even know what, what that is yet, but you know, they had ascended into a point of, of spiritual awareness and belief in the one true God of Abraham, um, seeing the miracles that Moses had led them uh, or, or led them through and had seen and followed, that they were at a point where like, whatever he says we will do. I mean, that would be incredible. That would absolutely be incredible. Um, so, you know, there's a, says here in verse 10, that the people had to sanctify themselves, God says, tell the people to sanctify themselves for tomorrow, they must uh, clothe or wash themselves in their clothing, basically a baptism, a mikvah, in preparation for on the third day I will meet with them. That's what it says here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you see kind of the parallels happening in the life of the believer now. It's a journey where you come from death, you're born again, and that's why baptism was, was the next step, right? Now, the rabbis teach that a, the baptism is, you know, you have to go into the water because man is earth, the Adama, so they have to go into the mikvah or the water so that it covers them completely, so they're in a separate dimension where it represents a death to their self and their impurity, and then they come out reborn. Now, I don't necessarily ascribe to this, but uh, I think there's some interesting points there, um, you know. But you see where the parallel is, is that we're baptized into the death and burial resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? So, um, yeah, I think that there's some interesting parallel there is a, a tied to a death of oneself and a rebirth when you come out the other side. So, um, you know, the day of the revelation here. It says, on the third day, in verse 16 of 19, on the third day when it was morning, there was thunder and lightning and heavy cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the shofar was very powerful, and the entire people that was in the camp shuddered. Moses brought the people from the camp toward God, and they stood at the bottom of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was smoking because Hashem had descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the entire mountain shuddered exceedingly. The sound of the shofar grew uh, continually much stronger, and Moses would speak, and God would respond to him with a voice. And it says, Hashem descended upon the mountain, the top of Mount Sinai, and summoned Moses up to the mountain, so he ascended. Now, you know, it's very interesting. It says, 
so some of the rabbinical commentary here in this Homish, which is a study Torah, uh, says that the revelation was heralded by some awesome display of thunder, lightning, smoke, shofar blasts, and fire. God's presence descended upon Mount Sinai. Thus, the stage was set for the most momentous moment in, his, in history. God's declaration of the Ten Commandments is seen, heard, and seen by millions of people. Based on the verses of this chapter in Exodus 24 and Deuteronomy 4, which all discuss the revelation of Sinai, the commentators derive that there are four levels of holiness corresponding to the levels of the temple. Thus, the temple was, in effect, a permanent recreation of Sinai, of the Sinai experience for, for individual Jew, Jews, which was to remain with the Jewish people throughout their entire history. Mount Sinai, therefore, there, therefore was not an isolated historic phenomenon, but one that should remain an integral part of one's life for all of, it, for all of its form of the, uh, of the temple. The four levels were the bottom of the mountain where the people stood, corresponding to the gate of the temple courtyard. The mountain itself corresponded uh, to the interior of the court, courtyard. The cloud where Moses stood corresponded to the holy place. And the very the the fire and the elements of the you know the Shekinah, the glory of God represents the holy of holies. So it's very interesting. Um, you know they also say here that when God spoke, no bird was chirping, no ox lowed, no angel ascended or seraph descended proclaiming holy. Everything was quiet. All, so they say that basically the, when God's voice went out and, and spoke before Israel said, whoa, we can't handle this. All creation heard God speak the Ten Commandments all at once. And the people were confused. So they heard voices. Co kind of interesting that that's similar to what happened in the book of Acts. Now, Modern Jewish practice for doing this feast, obviously, because there is no temple, is is a little bit different. They they still a lot of them decorate their homes with, uh, you know, with with spring flowers and and greenery. They do in their temples and synagogues as well. So it, it's it represents the harvest. It rep and it's not a coincidence you guys are talking about this today. And the Book of Ruth is read also during this time. Why? Because there's a special co uh, relation with this feast and the gers, or ger gerim, which means proselytes. People who were not Jewish, Gentiles, coming in and becoming part of Israel. So it represents the ingathering of the nations. Why did God choose Israel? Be to be a light to the nations. To be a holy priesthood and a, a, a kingdom of kings and priests. Now. Unfortunately, if you read a little bit further on, what ended up happening was, you know, the sin of the idol, the golden calf, right? And Israel's kind of descent into moral immorality kind of crept back up, you know? You know, in the New Covenant, we call it the sin of the flesh. You know, in the Old Covenant, in Genesis 6-5, it's called the Yitzhahara, which means like the evil inclination. And God said that he regretted making man because the, his thoughts or, or his in, evil in, inclination was always towards evil. So, you know, you see this, this kind of creep in, right? And it, it's unfortunate because, you know, Moses was up there and people were like, what's taking him so long? <laughs> what's taking him so long? Very interesting. And so they revert to doing something their own way and building the golden calf, right? I don't have time to get into everything today. The rabbis teach that that's why originally God's intention was not for the sacrificial system. That came as a response to their sin of the golden calf. The korbanot or the sacrifices were put in place at that point. And that's why they're right in the middle of the Torah because atonement is essential to serve God. They... Obviously, there's a major problem without there being a temple uh, for the Jewish people. Um, so, you know, obviously, yeah, I, I, I hope to, to really see. Anyway, I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, but, yeah, 
So you see the Corbin Oat system was introduced, um, the sacrificial system was introduced um, because obviously, you know, all these great things happened and Israel witnessed them. They witnessed the glory of God. They heard God's glory, but Moses was taking too long to come back. So they reverted to their own system, their own worship, their own way to God. And how many of us have done that? You know, we call them the golden caps. And I think that's explicitly why the world is in the situation it's in, because God has shut it all down. He is making people slay their golden calves. You know, whether it be money, business, travel, like it can be a lot of things, you know. Israel was called to be a nation that is sent to represent God, not be a community that just kind of huddled into themselves. But we as God's people now, the Jew, uh, the, uh, the, the believers and true believers of the God of Israel through Jesus, we are called to do something. Now I'm going to revert this now and show you in the new covenant, the new Torah, the correlation to this. So when Jesus resurrects, so that's obviously contrary to what the rabbis teach about the Torah, the revelation of Sinai being the most momentous event in human history. I agree to a certain point. Yes. I mean, everything stems off of the Torah. Like we have our, that's our entire foundation for all of us to have belief in God, Abraham, all of it comes from the Torah. Right. So, um, but the truth of it is the law was powerless to kill our evil inclination or our flesh. Right. It was powerless to, to empower us to actually go out and be a nation of priests and kings, right? We needed to, God had to change it in order for Israel to be a priestly nation. It meant the priesthood, it meant the sacrifices, it meant all these things. Whereas God's initial intention was all mankind would come to the knowledge of the Torah or the, the revelation of who God is, right? And that's why he sent Yeshua. That's why he sent Messiah. Now, when Jesus resurrects, he goes to the disciples in John 20 and breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. The disciples then, therefore, kind of enter into this process of preparation, right? They have to wait. They're waiting for the full revelation of like, what is the Holy Spirit? Like, what does that mean in full measure? Like, they understood the idea of Holy Spirit is clearly laid down in, in rabbinical writings that they understood what it was, but they didn't understand what it was, or who he was, I should say, rather. Um, they thought it just meant holy inspiration that God put upon people to speak, like the prophets and things like this. But they didn't understand that he's a person and that he is the, he's the, the great motivator, director, and the great sustainer of everything, right? They didn't understand it in that context. So they go through a process. It's, it's very interesting. So let's look at Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John, the Baptist, truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? This is, a, this is the, the sum of Jewish belief right here, that the Mashiach, the Messiah, will come, and he will restore Israel he will restore it because they believe that they lost their position as soon as they built the golden calf. That the carbon oak or the sacrifices were introduced specifically because they forfeited their right for to be that that shaliach or that 
a representation or one sent to represent God to the nations and see restoration for all creation. So this is a common belief, even in Jesus' time, that the Messiah is to rectify this major issue with the world around us and with Israel. So they were asking him, is this the time to restore the kingdom? He says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Judea and all, or in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. He's essentially saying, so they're called the disciples here. They're called students, Talmudim, students. But he's going to make them shaliach, which is where the word emissary or uh, apostle, one being sent in the full measure and authority of a king, right? That's what he's called us to do. We are to be bearers of this and witnesses of the giving of God's revelation to the entire world. So Jesus ascends in verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up in a cloud and received him from their sight. And what does it say here in verse 10? And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, angels, who said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will also come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So, how many of us are kind of just waiting? It's kind of the same thing. Same kind of story where, where they were waiting, looking into the sky. How, when's Jesus, where's he going? When's he coming back? Same thing with Moses. Where's he going? Where's he coming back? What's going on? The parallels between Jesus and Moses are, Moses are specifically laid out by the disciples in the Gospels on purpose. Right? John came to prepare Israel for the coming of the great deliverer. That's what the mikvah or baptism was about. They understood it from the proselyte baptism that Gentiles who wanted to believe and become part of Israel, right? The harvest. So they didn't understand what John the Baptist was doing. They were like, why do we have to be baptized? Does not make sense? And that's why he said, you think you have Abraham as your father, but God is able to raise up children unto Abraham out of these stones, right? So you see all of this is played out and unveiled, directly correlating back to the Torah, back to the revelation of Sinai or the, the giving of the Torah. The preparation Israel went through is the same thing we have to go through as a constant preparation and elevation of ourselves to be representatives of God's kingdom. Now, you remember what I read here about the fire and the sound and the trumpets and the shofar? Read Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost, or Shavuot, had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came and gathered, came together and were confused because everything that they heard, they heard them speaking in their own language. When they all, then they all were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language and in our own, or, or, in which the places of which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pomphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya. 
uh, joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own language and the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this be? What could it mean? Others, mocking, said they're full of new wine. This is very interesting because traditionally, uh, Jewish people during this time, the time of the Omer, read uh, a few different things to prepare themselves. And one of them is the Rome Call, which was a rabbi from Rome, uh, not so long after the time, it was about 500 AD, and he wrote a lot about what does that mean to prepare oneself. And, and uh, you know, interestingly enough, he points kind of to this, where he's talking about uh, being a late, somebody who's a mocker, a, a troll, which I guess we would call, we would call them now as a troll. Everyone's a troll. Um, and then that if you continue in a, in a, in a lifestyle of mockery and just not taking anything serious that God hands you over to being a late to somebody who's completely, uh, doesn't take anything serious and just actually not even reality serious anymore. And, and I feel like that's the world we live in today. Everything's a joke. It's it, nobody has any care or thought of, of speaking against authority of uh, anybody anymore. It's, it's out of control. And so I think that, you know, that's, that's something we're seeing very, very rapidly in, in our world right now. And, and, and it's concerning. Um, but so the response to obviously to anything that God does is one or the other, you're going to be believe, receive and believe, or you're going to mock. That's really it. <laughs> People are in one of two camps. You know, it's clear, it's pretty clear in the scriptures, and but our job doesn't change. Our job doesn't change. We're called to do something. You know, not stand and wait in the sky and be like, well, you know, this coronavirus is happening. It's a sign that Jesus is coming. This is ridiculous. People are doing this like crazy. We know the word is coming. That doesn't change our objective and our mission now. And I hope you're all nodding your head saying, amen, Peter. You know, we don't, we're not supposed to sit around and, like Jesus specifically said, he, the Father has put it within his own authority to know the times. We are called to do something. And what's that? To be shaliach, to be those that are sent, emissaries. And I'm going to point to that now. This is the giving of the new Torah within mankind. But Peter, standing up with the, the eleven raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and who dwell in Jerusalem, and let those be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, which was the morning. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saying, says God, that I will pour my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my maids, manservants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Yeshua HaNotzri, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you, but uh, by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the by the determined purpose that for and and foreknowledge of God that you had forsaken by law uh, have been taken by lawless hands have crucified and put him to death. So it goes on, obviously here talking about restoring the time of David, and it says that the Jews were cut to their heart and believed. And then the next chapter, actually the next verse in verse forty, you see that. Their, their title transitions from disciple to apostles, those being sent. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to kind of jump over here now. I'm going to end kind of in Paul's writings and show you kind of how it comes full circle. 
Um, but Paul basically wrote, if you if you look at any of the Mishnaic laws of like the rabbinical writings and stuff, that's how Paul basically wrote his his books as a as a rabbi's exegesis of things, and he pieces together literally everything from the Torah and the Old Covenant and puts it all together beautifully in his writings as to what it means from the faith of Abraham through all of it and why. And it's incredible, especially the book of Romans. It's a masterpiece. He wrote it to, a, you know, a community that had a massive Jewish population. Like we went to the ghetto last year, Sydney and myself, and it was, uh, you can still see the engravings of the menorahs and stuff in the walls there. It's pretty crazy. Um, but it's, it was massive. The ghetto is huge. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, the book of Romans is a masterpiece and you can, I would implore everyone to go through it kind of through the lens of Paul tackling the, this very topic. He's tackling what does the law look like of the law of Moses look like now that the Messiah has come. The rabbis hold that the, the law of the Messiah will come and trump the Torah and will explain to Israel why this was the way it was, what they were supposed to do, and institute a new law. The problem is, is they, they're out on their timing. I was talking with Jeff about this, and they're out on their timing, right? So that, that's a, the main issue here. Um, so they believe that the Messiah is going to institute a new Torah that's going to be inward and of the flesh, according to Jeremiah prophesied about it. So I'm going to look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7 here. He's talking about the spirit, not the letter. He says, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, which it was, I read the account. So that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly, even at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. Now, or how much more will the ministry of the Spirit be glorious? Now skip to verse 13. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at it at the end of that which was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains lift, unlifted when reading the Old Testament because the veil is taken away only in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lays upon their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, behold in, as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, this is, this is amazing because it, he, he, he literally lays out how the new covenant literally removes the veil. So the law, the letter of the law was powerful in that it brought the knowledge of God and his standard to the world, right? But it also brought, therefore, the knowledge of sin and death because before that, we wouldn't have had a, a clue. We wouldn't have known what God's standard was. And when we got it, we were like, wow, we're in trouble. <laughs> you know? So that's why Mashiach, Messiah had to come. He had to come as a propitiatory offering. Ironically, just skipping just a little tidbit for you, and I'm going to kind of pull this around full circle at the end, but the carbonate or the sacrificial system being instituted, the rabbis teach that they're all microcosms of man. So all of them represent a sin, an unintentional sin. There's no, there's no sacrifice for intentional, uh, intentional sin. Only the Day of Atonement, which, ironically, the scapegoat is the only sacrifice they can't explain. Not very well. But the other ones, like a ram, represents rebellion. 
and that's why they, that was sacrificed because it represented one's rebellion. Uh, a basar or like a ox represented arrogance and pride, you know, things like this. But the one they can't is the one that's about atonement, which is the only offering for intentional sin. Ironically enough, that's about Mashiach. Obviously, that's about the Messiah. So, um, yeah, I would love to do a bigger teaching on it, but I obviously can't for time's sake right now. Um, but you see, you know, they had the, the process of, of having to go and sacrifice and things like this. It was all veiled from them. It was all veiled from Israel. They, they, they didn't understand. They didn't understand because the process or the fulfillment and all pushing towards the coming of Mashiach so that the revelation of God could go to all mankind, not just the nation. Now, obviously, I'll get into more of that in a minute. Um, flip to 2 Corinthians 5.14. Why, though, do we receive the Spirit? And the new Torah that's in our hearts to do what? Well, it says right here, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, whether Jew or Gentile is what he's talking about here. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. This is Paul giving a direct answer to the rabbinical sages. Just, just a side comment. He's saying, yeah, we, the guy's here. He, you, you missed him. He's the guy that's recon, he's reconciled everything to himself through the Messiah already. You just have to believe. But it goes one step further. Not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, then, we are ambassadors, shaliach, emissaries. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This hits everything I'm just saying. I just said about the sacrificial system, the scapegoat, the law of, aton of the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. He who knew no sin became sin. He took it upon himself so that he could reconcile the world to himself and birth forth a people to be ambassadors of reconciliation to the world, to bring the rectification of the world, right? Very interesting. It's, a, it's very powerful. It's very powerful how you see it's all connected. So you see Paul is unveiling it, basically giving all the answers that the Torah basically causes the rabbis to write. <laughs> They've written, you know, millions and millions of books and commentaries. I mean, you read the, the Talmud is huge and contains even stuff from the Sanhedrin in the time of Jesus, you know, so that they were trying to figure out and work through. But the main piece is the new covenant came to, by the Spirit, in us, to illuminate us to the knowledge of God without a veiled face, to behold him. A shaliach is somebody who is sent from or an apostle, whatever you, if you want to use the word apostle, that's fine too. Ambassador, they're an ambassador. You don't represent where you're, you, you represent where you're sent from and who you're sent from, not where you are, right? So, we are called to be 
representations of the Messiah in the world. We are called to be his image in the world. That's the, the, the word shaliach means one who stands as the image of the one who sent them. So that's why Peter is walking and his shadow is healing people just like Messiah. That's why unusual miracles were done by the hand of Paul just like Jesus because they were sent in the image and likeness of him, of, of Jesus, of, of the Messiah. It's very powerful. You know, kind of going full circle here and bringing it back together is looking at why Ruth is red during this time. Ruth represents the ger gerim or Ger, the word Ger means someone who is a Gentile became part of Israel, who said, you know, your people are my people, where you go, I will go, your God will be my God, so on and so forth, right? So it's somebody who came into the house of Israel and was brought in and became a believer in the God of Abraham. They had the same rights as the Jewish people in, in according to the Torah and according to rabbinical law. Uh, they just didn't have patron. Uh, you know, land, they didn't have, uh, they didn't have their, their uh, lineage in the sense of land division and giving of territories like the, like the Levites, actually. So there was a special commandment to protect uh, Ger or proselytes because God uh, kind of saw them in the same light as Levites. Like they didn't have a, 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 you know, territory. They didn't have a camp. They didn't have a, you know, division in the land. Um, you know, the only people who were not allowed to marry them, only Jews who were not allowed to marry uh, a convert was the priests and the high priests specifically. And so they were Jewish for three generations, but, you know, very powerfully, uh, the story of Ruth is a great picture of, people who are not God's people coming into the house of faith with the house of Israel. And they're the ones that are what bringing in the harvest. They're bringing in the harvest. Very interesting. This time, uh, you know, in the temple, they would bring two loaves, different loaves representing the, the new harvest to the high priest, Jew and Gentile together in one offering. To God, you know, it's not not a coincidence. It's all there. This speaks of the harvest. This woman becomes part of not just the the people of Israel. She becomes the the mother of Obed, who becomes who births Jesse, who births David, right? The King David, who then is obviously the forefather of Jesus. So, you know, I think that great picture of the, the, uh, the harvest and how God is going to use the Gentile nations to bring in the harvest of the Jewish people. It's very interesting here. And this is why Paul alludes to certain things in Romans. Talks about who is, he tackles who is a Jew. One who does the law in their heart of their own free will. That's the same law that the Ger was. They are considered righteous like Abraham because they choose to submit to the law of God in their heart. They are not obligated to, but they choose to. And that's why Paul is using this kind of wording. But he says, you know, obviously what merit is there in being Jewish or Jewish people, obviously much in every way, he says, because chiefly the, the oracles of God were entrusted to them. But there was for a purpose. Right? So he's talking, and then if you skip through to chapter 9, verse 6 of Romans, he says here very clearly about God's people, and essentially Israel's rejection of the Messiah, but it is not that the word of God was taking no effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But, so he's saying, not just because you are a direct descendant or you can trace your blood to Abraham as a Jewish person, which was 
again, he's pointing to the law, the Torah here, and the rabbinical thought was that those that are born Jewish uh, have a different position because their ancestors were at Sinai, and therefore you were there within them spiritually. So he's saying that doesn't have any merit, right? He's saying it's not just that you're the seed of one Abraham physically, but in Isaac, the promise seed, you shall be called. That's where the calling was. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise. They are counted as the seed. Interesting. You know, so Paul is kind of laying it out here in response to, you know, obviously there was stuff going on in the early church of, like, what do we do with all these Gentiles coming in, you know? Well, it was the fulfillment of Jesus' Messiahship was that the Gentiles were coming to faith in the God of Israel. That's still the greatest sign that I, I would argue with any rabbi. Okay, well, how do you explain all these Gentile people believing in our God, like the God of Israel? If You know, what do you do with that? If you don't believe in Jesus, like, then Israel never had that opportunity. We never did that. Like, that never happened because of, because of us. We were disobedient. So, Paul lays out the next step. It's very interesting because the, the correlation between Abraham and faith God said to Abraham in Genesis 12, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In Hebrew, it doesn't say blessed. It implies engrafted. All the nations of the earth shall bind themselves to you. In you, they will be bound or they will be engrafted, meaning the tree of faith or Israel, right? And that's why in Romans 11, verse 11, Paul lays out, about the kind of the situation with Israel, even modern, it relates to it now, about the, the olive tree and the ingrafted branches of, that are Gentile. And I say, I have, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, talking about Israel, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, for all nations, and their failure, riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh and save some of them. He's talking about Jews now. For if their being, their being cast away is reconciliation to, of the world or the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be of the gospel but life from the dead? For if the first fruit when that's, it, uh, is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. But do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say to them, uh, say then, Branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, Otherwise, you will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to your nature into the cultivated olive tree, how much more will these that are natural branches be grafted back into their own tree? 
for it for I do not desire bre- uh, de- for I do not desire brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has be- happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and so all Israel will be saved as it is written the deliverer just like Moses will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them that I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Incredible. Uh, I, you know, it's, there's a lot I could say on that, obviously. It's, you know, that was the whole point, right? that the church was spread abroad to bring the gospel to Jew and Gentile, to the Jew first and to the Gentiles. That's, that was Jesus's command that was laid out. But the Gentiles coming in represent, just like Ruth, bringing it back full circle and bringing in the harvest before God, bringing in the harvest of Israel. That's our objective, obviously, as the church is, we, you know, we can't just sit around idly. We're supposed to do something. You know, Paul lays it out really clear, and it's, it's brilliant because then he goes on to talking about being a Corbin Kai, a living sacrifice, you know, after this, right after this, actually, kind of paralleling what happened in the Torah. It's incredible. It's, it's, it's a masterpiece. The Book of Romans is a masterpiece. You know, so I implore everybody, take this time seriously to, to – you know, really seek God and, and really do self accounting, you know, of your soul. And are we doing what we're supposed to be doing as God's people? We have been, we have received the greatest promise The you know, the Peter said, like the, the, the end result, the end promise of, of, of the Torah was the Holy spirit. We've received that. We're not supposed to be huddled and hiding and kumbayaing and shaka rakas all day long we're supposed to do something we are called to be representatives of the new and better torah it lives within us and we have to go out and do something with it so i I implore everybody to take this last few days shavuot Shavuot starts at sundown on on thursday uh that is the feast of pentecost and you know that's I, I believe God's going to do something. I really do. I believe something monumental is going to happen in the sense of healing for our land, uh, exposure of that which is in darkness. And I see, uh, you know, I'm really believing that it'll be an end to, um, you know, this season that we're in and this process. I thank God for the time off because it's, you know, I've worked, I've been working, but obviously in a much lesser capacity than normal. Um, and it's allowed me a lot of time to study Hebrew and, and get back into it. And I'm really thankful because God's really uh, highlighted a lot of things for me. And I hope that came out today and blessed you guys and uh, ministered to you of how great, you know, how great of a responsibility we have as God's people to respond appropriately to our experiences um, that are supernatural. You know, knowledge unapplied is a sin. And this is what the rabbis teach, and I agree with that. You know, that's a, that's a really serious thing. So we need to take our encounters with God, and it, it must be a catalyst for us to do something. For what? To be ministers of reconciliation and to see uh, con- the continual growth of the family of the Messiah. That was the whole idea with Ruth and coming in and being grafted physically into the family of the Messiah is a symbol of Jew and Gentile coming together in the family of the Messiah, the reconciliation of all creation, which was Israel's purpose uh, to some degree, but it, 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 you know, it's bigger than that. You know, we know that Israel's main purpose was to birth the Messiah, to see it all come to, to, to a close or to all come into full view. Right. So I hope this blesses you. Um, Again, uh, pray, seek God, you know, thank him for the Holy spirit. And, you know, hopefully this empowers you to go and do something. Amen. Uh, God bless.